Hello and welcome back to AmbiV. I'm Casper and today we're going to be doing a few things on the SR240Z project including installing a new fuel pump to get it ready for some break-in driving. Let me apologize for the noise first of all. The 3D printer is currently running over on the bench that I just bought set up and I'm still trying to figure out. I'm brand new to the world of 3D printing but this thing is a pain in the ass. Do not assume these are professional tool level products. These things are a hobby that you need to get very familiar with just to get decent starting point for making anything. Now, this is a product of me having reached out to Chris from Bias for Build to have him prototype some parts and then coming up with a ton more parts I wanted to prototype and deciding it was far more efficient for me to just buy my own than bothering him all the time. So now you'll be seeing a lot more parts being made here for prototyping and sizing but I won't be primarily talking about the 3D printers on this channel. I'll be setting up another channel for all these side projects and other interesting tools and things that aren't directly automotive. So keep your eye out for that. You can find a link for it down in the description below. Now behind me, you see the SR240Z project car. This has a built S13 SR20 DET engine that should be good for about 500 horsepower, but is currently making about 350 wheel horsepower. Now, I need to get the car broken in because I need to get the first oil change done and continue tuning because I want this car completely drivable like a street car. But the only thing that isn't done now is the fuel system. In my previous video, you saw me wrap up most of the electrical system, at least well enough for driving and breaking in, but the fuel system is still to be done because it is an AEM 300 liter per hour fuel pump external to the fuel tank. So the fuel tank feeds it by gravity to the fuel pump, which then pressurizes the system and return line sends back in and dumps into the tank. Now, two big problems with that is the return line is currently just spraying fuel in the top of the tank because I had a malfunction with my installation of the return line, namely that it was completely corroded over and full of rust, so I just broke the return tube off, drilled a new hole, and stuck a 6AN bung on it. But for the return point, it's spraying it at the top of the tank, which is aerating the fuel like crazy and heating it up unnecessarily. Additionally, the factory pickup doesn't have baffling or anything to help it actually get the fuel into the lines to get to the fuel pump, so you have some aeration problems and also some starvation problems during hard acceleration. Here's an example of what I was dealing with with starvation. <laughs> Now, as best as I can estimate, that breakup is due to the fuel moving away from the pickup and being so aerated and frothed that I'm not getting a consistent feed from the fuel pump. Now, an external fuel pump is never the greatest solution. I would much rather have an in-tank solution unless I had a baffled or raced fuel cell that I could guarantee I was getting good pickup from. But I don't want to put a fuel cell in this car because that defeats the part of making it streetable. Now, what I can do is retrofit the existing fuel tank with this Holly kit. This kit I'm about to show you, I bought a few years ago, wasn't sure which car it was going on, but now I do because I want to get this thing on the street. So let's go ahead and get the box open and see what we're working with. So here we have the drop-in fuel retrofit kit that I have from Holly. This has been sitting on the shelf in my shop for quite a few years while I decided what car to use it on, but I really like the looks of it. Basically what you've got is you've got a billet aluminum top hat that goes down into your tank. You don't have to weld because the hole saw portion is clamped over by these little arms that then squeeze it down to this gasket. So it's not something you have to completely dry the tank for in order to weld and clean on it. Additionally, it comes with the material for spacing it out from the top of the tank to the car. It also includes one of their hydromat units, which instead of just being a basic fuel sock filter, actually wicks the fuel up to the pump, which helps when the fuel level is really low or you're dealing with a lot of sloshing fuel. And then it also comes with a Walboro 255 fuel pump. Now I'm really hoping this Walboro is a lot better than the Walboro that came with the kit they sent me for the Mustang tank replacement because that thing was loud, didn't seem to work that well, and seemed to get way too warm for the amount of force it was actually putting out. So this may be getting replaced with the DW unit down the road. But let's see if we can get this to fit in the 240Z fuel tank. Now that the tank's out of the car, we can take a look at it here and see what the leak was. It looks like what was still leaking while it was in the car is actually the sending unit. The sending unit here is pretty dirty and looks like it's wet and the ring is not snapped all the way into place. So my guess is that's what's been leaking whenever I fill the tank completely up. Now, if I'm going to install this 
poly unit in here, I'm going to have to cut a pretty good sized hole in the top. And wherever that goes down is going to have to go down in a position that doesn't interfere with the sending unit, but is in this deeper part of the tank. So it'll probably have to be somewhere maybe like in this area here. So let's grab a hole saw and see what it would look like. So this is the three and a quarter inch hole saw that the installation kit calls for. And as we can see, it's actually not that big. So I want it in the taller part of the tank, both because I want the depth, but also because this is where the original pickup is and kind of where the baffling is supporting getting uh, fuel too. But also because one thing I have to contend with on this system is going to be where the level sender is. Now the level sender in this car is basically just a float on a little stainless steel rod. You can see the float there going deeper into the tank. And when that goes up, that tells you how much fuel there is. Well, I don't want to impede that thing's ability to go up and down or I won't have any way to tell how much fuel's in there. Fortunately, because this is so small, that tends to, that seems to run right here and it'll be to the side of this. So as long as I don't pin it to the ground with the mat at the bottom of the filter, I should be fine. Now, the second question is whether or not I can space this out from the body of the car enough to not smash the top of this new unit and, and damage that. Not that you'll be able to see it, but I'd prefer it not get all scratched up and destroyed. It comes with some of the thick weather stripping type material to space it out. We'll just have to see if that'll work. I'll also block off all of these vents um, or at least loop them around and tie them together because the new unit comes with an atmospheric vent and I'll probably just be using that rather than trying to tie through the weird charcoal canister thing this car had before. So I guess all that's left is to just go ahead and start cutting. So now that we have a hole cut in the tank here, you can see that by doing it off center, I'm not interfering with the level sender over there. So this is a pretty nice open space to put it in. My hydromat will work as both a filter and a pickup assistant for the fuel pump, but I still flushed out, blew out, and then wiped out every metal filing I could get a hold of down in there. So it should have very little it has to screen out. Ideally, there shouldn't be anything getting through there, but I do also have a 30 micron up at the engine that'll be catching any tiny particles. Now that I have the hole here, I need to get the unit set up for the appropriate depth, get this measured. I need to ensure that I will be able to get my lines and everything fed out the direction I need to go, and then cap off all of these other uh, lines, the original sender and return, as well as these vents. I also went ahead and retightened the fuel sender ring here. It was just loose. Uh, the O-ring was still in perfect condition. So at some point, whoever put that on the last time must just not have knocked it all the way into place to where it locked and it had slowly vibrated its way backwards. But I think now we're ready to start playing with getting the unit installed. So now that we've got it in the tank, I'm going to test that the pump works, that my wiring connections are good, and to make sure that there's no leaks on these random fittings that I found to put in the tank. So the first thing to do to test this out is I've made a loop of line that just goes from the out to the return, and to simulate it having some resistance on it like a fuel pressure regulator, I'm just going to put my pliers on there to make a little bit of a kink. So now, if I take my power probe and hook my power probe to 
the negative and then take my probe tip and touch it to the positive, it tells me I have a good circuit. So if I send positive out this, the fuel pump is priming up. It's running a lot of fuel through. I can see it down through the opening and nothing's leaking. So I think that's a reasonable enough test for right now. I know my pump works and stuff, so I'll just have to check for leaks after I get it installed in the car. So when I got the car back up in the air to work on the fuel system, I decided to pull the fill plug out of the differential and I heard a loud hissing noise and it pumped a bunch of fluid out. So that's why it's all shiny. Now that's probably because the breather valve's not working. Differentials are supposed to allow the excess pressure to escape and this one seems to not be doing that. And the problem probably wasn't too much fluid being in there for why it pumped it out, but rather because the pressure wasn't escaping, it probably put a bunch of bubbles into the fluid and that pressure was escaping it. So I'm gonna go ahead and drain all the fluid anyway and refill it to the right level again just to be safe. But in order to get that out, I need to take down this exhaust. And one of my pet peeves about the current structure of the exhaust is this stupid clamp here. That's the only part that isn't welded or a flange. And it keeps like scratching through the exhaust and making it look ugly. Not to mention it, it moves around and loosens up. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull this off while I'm doing this and just see if I can weld this exhaust up or add a flange here just to be done with it. Yeah, my girlfriend's welds aren't too bad for first time ever TIG welding and having to close basically like a almost 3 8 inch gap. Now I'll grind this all down and I'll paint over the top of it like the rest of the pipe is. And I'll also come back here, grind down and then re-weld real quick while I have my welder turned on. This one that a shop did. Now this was a professional weld and it looks terrible. Um, but it's been on here for years and it hasn't failed, so I don't really want to grind off and re-weld it. But I do want to at least fix those little leaks that are right there and are very apparent. And then I can go ahead and get this drying and I can move on to the differential. Still feels like it's probably pretty hot. This is just a pretty relaxed shakedown drive. This car, according to the odometer, only has just over 100 miles on it since the build. And while we did get some basic braking and tuning done, I've changed a lot of stuff and I want to make sure nothing's going to cause a problem. Unlike a lot of automotive YouTubers who seem to have endless supplies of money, this was a pretty expensive motor build and I don't intend to have to do it again. Not sure that I could actually do it again if I wanted to. Now, one thing I've really noticed on this car, the alignment is definitely a little too active for street driving. It's more of an alignment for autocross. Which is exactly what I told the shop who did it to shoot for. It was a pretty standard autocross alignment. The only downside to that is it makes it very busy. The front end wants to jump all over. Oh wow, I found some really slow moving old person. I'm not exactly moving very quickly. I'm only going 40. And this person is barely moving. Yeah, this has to be some retiree out on a out on a dawdle. Like I was saying, the steering is very busy. But the steering should be pretty busy. That's what I had it aligned for, so that's not a surprise. I'll just take it easy. We're not trying to set any lap records here. I just want to get some more miles on the build, shake things out after all the work I just did, and start getting it ready for the next round of tuning. Obviously, it still has a few issues. Tip-in isn't very good. My O2 sensor feedback from the wideband 
isn't working because the O2 wideband isn't working. Don't know why, it's an AEM gauge. Was working fine before I sent it to tuning, came back from tuning broken, so who knows what's up with that. I also don't wanna push it too hard because I only just sorted out the differential vent and I wanna find out if it's actually fixed before I pump another like couple quarts of red line all over the road. Now, these tires are a little old. They're older than I like on these cars. Um, they're a few years old at this point from sitting and just being used to push the car around. So I also don't wanna push them too hard. They're uh, a little bit of an unknown quantity, but they're a good brand. They're Continental Extreme Contact DWSs from a few generations ago. Now, one of the best things about this car so far that I'm finding, the suspension is super predictable. I'm really liking the Technotoy tuning coilovers. These are uh, very predictable, very flat, but not harsh and aggressively uh, sprung. I'm getting very good road contact, even on this bad surface. But the tune definitely needs some work. Partial tip-in and tip-in where you would be doing most of your street driving, not so great. It's got some breakup and some strangeness to it. It's tuned a little bit more for safety, so I kind of understand that. It's probably tipping in a little rich, but I don't want to be beaten on this thing right now with this tune. I just want to make sure everything's broken in so I can do an oil change before we go to the dyno. I'll also be bringing another set of plugs that are slightly colder to the dyno in case we want to up the boost. I think we're sitting at a cap around 20 PSI, somewhere in there, which for this turbo is pretty good. I mean, I don't want to try to max this turbo out like a lot of people do where you get well out of the efficiency of the turbo. Just because, I mean, what are you gaining? You're gaining a few PSI, but you're losing a lot of efficiency. Your horsepower gains are minimal, and the life of the turbo is almost like days rather than what it would be. I'll be replacing the turbo with a top mount setup anyway, so this is really just for shakedown and initial break-in. Right now, the tune sits at about 350 wheel horsepower, just over 350 wheel. So it's a peppy tune, and it's got a loads of torque. So this is something that I think is probably the most streetable this car may be, unless I get a really nice twin scroll EFR setup because if I go any higher in power, it'll probably be with a fairly substantial turbo, which will then also mean the lag will be that much worse. That's a pretty slow tip in, and the boost builds really well. I would say that if I were going to just have this as a for fun weekend car or daily driver, I'd probably leave it here. But since my friend has a thousand horsepower Z32, I don't think I can leave this at 350 wheel horsepower. Also, after spending some time driving the Dodge Viper, I kind of like having that extra power. This car is actually faster than the Viper. The Viper is 505 horsepower crank, but it's also over a thousand pounds heavier. So this thing already has a 20% better power to weight ratio. It just doesn't feel like it. Now that I'm getting the interior back in it though, at least it's starting to feel like a car again. I didn't want this to feel like a stripped race car. I definitely wanted to have things like a dashboard and have basic amenities like the, the transmission tunnel being plugged up. Bunch of motorcycles. Now that I'm not getting... Now that I'm not getting sandblasted when I accelerate from the hole in the transmission tunnel, it's pretty nice. Everything looks pretty good on my gauges, but I can smell a little bit of gear oil, so I'm hoping I don't either have a leaky plug on the diff or that my transmission isn't leaking a little bit. I had to play with both, so some fluid came out of both of them while we were messing around. This car is getting dangerously close to version 1.0, where I'm gonna leave it for a little while while I break it in, feel it all out, 
before I make the next big jumps in performance. this turbo just comes on. Unfortunately, everyone else on this road drives incredibly slowly. It seems like I'm going fast to catch up to them, but I'm only going 40, 50 miles an hour. This isn't, uh, this isn't nearly what this car could be doing. A lot of these cornering speeds are very cautious. I don't know what's around the corner, so I'm not gonna be driving dangerously on public roads. And also, I'm starting to wonder if maybe I have a little bit of a fluid leak or something that I'm going to need to address. So I think this will probably be I think this will probably be the return trip. I don't even know if my audio is working or not, but I'll at least get some decent just driving footage. So the rest of the trip, let's just enjoy the sounds of the car. fuel pump in the car seems to have fixed the issues I was hoping it would fix and it made the car a lot quieter when it's priming. Now I also got that little fuel sender leak fixed. That was pretty simple. Just cut a piece of gasket material to put under the ring, crimped it all back down, pounded everything back into place and tightened it all the way up and we're good to go. I also went ahead and fixed that issue with the differential and that's exactly why if you install a big part on a car you should always check on it a few miles after installation. That fill plug coming loose and hissing was a super good indicator that there was a problem before it became a big problem. The only other way I would have found out that that problem exists would have been if it started pumping fluid out of the differential or if I would have just had the differential overheat because of all the churning and aeration of the oil. Neither solution would have been very good. That was an easy catch. I drained everything. I fixed the issue, cleared the breather, filled it with all new redline fluid. So we're good to go. So we shouldn't have any problems there. The next time you see this car, hopefully it'll be because I finished braking in the engine and we're back down on the dyno for drivability tuning. Thank you all for watching. If you have any questions about anything in this video, please leave them in the comments down below. And as always, I'll see you in the next video.